Let's begin with a word of prayer, please. Let's still our hearts in the Lord's presence. Heavenly Father, we do thank thee and praise thee for the opportunity to be back in thy house. And Lord, we rejoice at thy goodness toward us. And we pray now that thou be pleased to prepare our hearts for thy worship. We ask that thou cleanse us afresh. Help us to sing and pray and read and be attentive to thy word with all due diligence. And we ask that we may meet with thee today. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Hymn number 317, please. Hymn number 317, page 304. Behold what love, what boundless love, the Father hath bestowed on sinners lost, that we should be now called the sons of God. We'll stand as we sing after the introduction, 317. Let's stand together. Let's come before the Lord once again in a word of prayer, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed in the Master's presence. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee and praise Thee for each one in this gathering that can marvel and wonder at the fact that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. And what a truth that is. We rejoice that Thou art the triune God. We rejoice that Thou art the sovereign God. We rejoice that thou art the God of heaven. Thou art not a God in heaven, but thou art the God of heaven, the one true and living God. And we thank thee that us, as mere dust of the ground, and as one Puritan put it, as rebellious dust at that, oh, how humbled we are to consider the fact that thy precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that come down from heaven's glory, come to this wicked world of ours, and yet live a righteous, pure, holy, sinless life 
in complete obedience and satisfaction of the law's demands. And we thank thee that then he went to the cross. How we rejoice in the atoning death that took place at Calvary. How we praise thee for the precious blood. And all oh God, as we consider what John writes, that it is the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, that cleanseth us from all sin. O oh God, when we consider our Lord, when we consider what Christ has done, when we consider the blood that was shed, oh, how we thank thee that today we can be called and termed the sons and daughters of God. And, O oh Father, as we approach thy throne, we ask for thy help today. We need thy help. We freely admit that. We confess our own inability, our own weakness, our own lack of anything that is necessary. But, O oh God, we thank thee that thou hast promised to strengthen us, to keep us, to help us. Thou hast promised us in thy word, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And, O oh Father, we ask that that may be true of each and every one of us today. We pray that that would be true of our brother as he preaches thy word to us in this morning hour. We pray that he may know great strength, and not just great strength, but divine strength, strength from thee. And, O oh God, we pray the same for myself and for each one that is in the pews. Give us strength to worship thy name aright. O oh God, save us from just going through the rituals and the motions and uh, some form of a Protestant popery by just doing what we always do. But, O oh God, we pray that we may be those that, that mean every word that we sing, that we, may, that we may enter into the place of prayer together and, and rejoice that we even have the privilege of prayer. O oh God, help us to, to read thy word with the diligence that it deserves, knowing it's not fiction, it's not uh, just the work of men's hands, but it is uh, God-breathed, inspired truth. O oh God, we pray that thou bless the preaching of thy truth in particular to our hearts. Lord, we come before thee today in this house and we freely confess we need a word from thee. We need to be spoken to. And, O oh God, we ask that each one may know that, that the Lord has visited not only this house, but they can say, the Lord has visited my heart. O oh God, we pray for thy people. Revive thy people today. Set us on fire for God, we plead. O oh Father, we pray for the backslider. Thou knowest who they may be, and maybe they've wandered away from thee, and they know, even though they're found in this meeting today, they know they're not walking with thee. O oh God, we pray, restore them back unto thyself. And, O oh Father, we pray for the sinner that is in our midst. Thou knowest there are those that attend so faithfully, and they would hardly miss a meeting, and we would miss them if they weren't in their place. And yet they don't know thee. They're not saved. O oh God, speak to their hearts today. We pray that the gospel may pierce through their souls, through their hearts like an arrow through a heart of flesh, and that we may rejoice over souls that have come to the foot of the cross in faith and repentance. But, O oh God, we pray for our province today. Thou knowest our hearts are grieved when we think of this marathon that is once again being run on a Sunday. We pray that the organizers of such an event may repent of their sin and that this event would be rescheduled for a Saturday as it once was and that thy, thy day may be preserved and sanctified in the way it ought to be. O oh God, we pray for our King. We pray that thou would save his soul. Lord, we pray that thou would help us even as we watch the pomp and the ceremony and all of those things to Come on Saturday, and we know that we are a nation good at those things. Help us to have an eye upon the pomp and ceremony and glory of the kingdom of heaven as we think of that day when the King of kings and Lord of lords will come from heaven's glory to this world afresh. Oh, Father, help us to ever keep our eye upon Christ. And we pray for those that are sick in the church family. Oh, God, there are those that need a special touch from thee. And we miss them. We miss them in their place. O oh God, bless them today. But Lord, undertake for our need now in this hour. Come and visit with us in a wonderful, a special, in a supernatural way. We ask these things in and through the Saviour's lovely, worthy, and most precious name. 
Amen. We're going to sing again hymn number 411, please. Hymn number 411, page 343. I want, dear Lord, a heart that's true and clean, a sunlit heart with not a cloud between, a heart like thine, a heart divine, a heart as white as snow on me, dear Lord, a heart like this bestow. Let's stand as we sing 411, please. Let's stand together. Turning in the Word of God together, please, to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. And we only have a short reading, but nonetheless, important that we give it due diligence. It is the Word of God, food for our souls. Proverbs 23, we're going to break into the chapter at the verse 22, and we're just going to read to the end of the verse 26. Verse 12 to 26, Proverbs 23, and beginning our reading at the verse 12. Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reign shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Buy the truth, and sell it not. Also wisdom, and instruction, and understanding. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. We trust the Lord will bless the public reading of his holy and precious word to each of our hearts. Now at this point in the service, let me bid each one a, a very warm welcome in the Saviour's name. It's good to see each one, and let me say it is good to be back. And we give a very special welcome to our brother, the Reverend McLernan, today. And we trust that the Lord will bless him and us as he preaches the word of God 
to our hearts. Please remember the gospel service tonight at 7 p.m. That's preceded by a half-hour prayer at 6.30. God willing, I'll be the preacher, and we'll be looking at the title, The Gospel of Jesus Christ. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'd appreciate your encouragement by your attendance. Then for the week ahead of us on Tuesday, the gospel bus meeting for the boys and girls recommences at 7 p.m., So I trust you'll remember that if you have any children in your neighborhood, neighbors, maybe grandchildren, people like that, children you know that as yet don't come to the gospel bus meeting. You invite them along. I know there'll be leaflets available. You give them a leaflet. And if you don't know anyone to invite, you can pray for that work. And I trust that God's people, that even at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, you'll set that time aside and you'll just pray. You say, Lord, bless that meeting and save souls. But please remember that as it recommences on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Then on Wednesday, the prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m. And then on Friday, there'll be no youth fellowship due to it being presbytery week. So no youth fellowship. Please remember that. Young people. Then the services next Lord's Day, the Sabbath school and Bible class at 1045 and the morning worship at 12 noon. God willing, I'll be preaching at both those meetings, preceded by a time of prayer at 1130 And then an evening gospel service, 7 p.m., I'll be leading, and there'll be a testimony from Mr. Aaron Fitzsimons, and that meeting also preceded by a half hour of prayer. Please remember, as you leave today, is our maintenance fund offering, and I know that your generosity would be appreciated in that way. There's some things the committee would like to do by way of maintenance, and we trust that you will remember that today. And then next Lord's Day, there's the retiring missionary offering. But let me just say a a personal word. I want to thank you all for your prayers and also for your patience over the last number of weeks. I know God's people have been praying, and I don't believe in a sixth sense or anything like that, but you feel the prayers of God's people. You know God's people are praying, and I believe that. And I say it's good to be back with you. I'm very glad to be back with you. Uh, I say with no exaggeration that there was a few times I didn't think I would ever stand in this pulpit again. And I rejoice that I'm here even to do this this morning. And I thank you for your prayers. To be honest, I don't know why doctors call sick people patients, because you could put I am in front of that and call me an impatient. Uh, I didn't enjoy being away at all. I can freely say that as well. Uh, But please do remember me in your prayers. Don't stop praying for me now. I appreciate that even you pray more, that the Lord would give help and strength as we endeavor to get back into, into fifth and sixth gear and get going for God. I don't intend on sitting about for long, so I trust that you'll remember me in that. But please do remember each one that that is sick at this time. I know there's many suffering with this, and I think it's given me a greater appreciation for what others go through, even to have a pastor's heart uh, as well. And I was only thinking the other day that maybe I should stay away more often because I I was glad to hear that uh, the congregation's gone up by one with the birth of wee Heidi, so we're glad of that. The congregation's grown in that time, and also here of souls saved as well. The Lord has been good, so please do remember these things, that the Lord will continue to bless us and give more power and more strength even in the days to come. But please do remember those that are sick. There's many in our church family that are sick at this time. They need our prayers. They're shut in. And please remember those that have been bereaved of late as well. And not only pray for them, but even if you can, a wee visit, a phone call, a card, just to let them know you're thinking about them. Remember them. We're a family. Let's consider those things. But of course, all these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. But we're going to sing again. Hymn number 644. 644, page 436. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. We'll keep our seats while our tithes and offerings are collected for the work in this place. 644.
done for the last verse. I invite you to turn, please, to the book of Proverbs. First of all, the opening chapter of the book, if you would, please, Proverbs chapter 1. I thank Mr. Henderson for leading the meeting today and for his words of welcome. It's lovely to be back with you. I thank you for your encouragements and your prayerful support, but I know you're delighted to see Mr. Henderson back, and I know you'd rather have him here than me, but uh, you'll get that blessing tonight. I trust the Lord will indeed continue to keep his good hand upon thy servant, his servant and make him to be a blessing even in this place among you. With God's word open before us, let's just seek the Lord's face in a word of prayer. Can we encourage each one to pray? Lord, let there be a word from my soul today. Only the Lord knows her needs knows the state of our hearts. And you know how things are between you and the Lord. And pray his blessing upon your soul, even at this time. Our loving God and our Father, we are so thankful that in all our circumstances, we can turn to thee. Thou art the God of creation, the God of our salvation. Our prayer is, Lord, that thou will come near even now as we look into thy word. We ask thee to speak to our hearts. We pray for preparation of heart. Oh, deliver us, Lord, from going through the motions that have been prayed already. Deliver us from putting on a show. We pray that thou will give us a genuineness, reality about our faith. Take us away from this house today with a renewed determination that we'll be at our best for thee and for thy glory. Encourage the people of God in this house. We well, thank thee for thy servant. Thank you, Lord, for bringing him back into the midst. And we pray thy richest blessing upon him and upon his ministry. And then remembering again those, Lord, who need that special touch in the body. Realize the physical frame isn't made to last and it succumbs to all all kinds of ailments and difficulties, but we look to thee. Thou art the great physician. There are no mistakes with thee, and we thank the Lord we can commit our way to thee, and we do. We pray whatever our circumstances today, come bless our hearts, do as good we ask of thee, and grant that in and through each one of us, in spite of our many failings and shortcomings, in spite of us, Lord, use us for thy glory and the extension of thy kingdom. Come now, we pray, Bless our souls, make thy word to be a challenge, a blessing to our hearts. And we pray that the end result would be that thy name would be glorified, thy kingdom extended. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. In chapter one of Proverbs, we're introduced to the author of the book, Solomon. The man who is probably best remembered as having asked God for wisdom and uh, in answer to that became the wisest of men apart from the Lord himself. People today still talk about needing the wisdom of Solomon and we do. And beloved, James, James 1 verse 5 declares, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not. In other words, the Lord will not cast it up to you that you've come asking. This book begins with a clear statement of its purpose, and that is to impart wisdom for godly living. Notice the opening verse of chapter 1, the opening verses. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, to know wisdom 
and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Then notice verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Much of what Solomon writes is directed at young men. Though it goes without saying, the people of all ages will benefit from the instruction found herein. It was David, his, his father, who said in Psalm 119, verse 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. And in the very next breath, David said, With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. So there's, there's a distinct link here between wisdom, the heart, and the word of God. And that's not without significance. Chapter 9, verse 10 reads, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Job said, in Job 28, verse 28, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. And the word fear in that instance is a word that just means reverence. That's something that's sadly lacking in many quarters today. Even, sadly, in some church circles, reverence for the things of God. Reverence for God's house. Not much reverence for God's day today, is there? with a marathon being run in Belfast. But then let's come over to chapter 23, which uh, Mr. Henderson read for us. Verse 23, uh, sorry, chapter 23, and verse 17. And uh, here Solomon says, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. That just really means all the days, every day, you live. But perhaps the thought may come to mind that while some profess to fear the Lord all day, what of the night? How many who call themselves Christian are to be found doing things under cover of darkness that ill befit those who claim to belong to Christ? The Christian must fear the Lord at night as well as in the day. If one lives only for the nightlife that this world offers, we'd have to put a question mark over that one's profession of salvation. Can we ask you today, beloved, with respect, just where does your heart really lie? Is it in the things of God? Or is it in the things of this world? Is it in the things of eternal day? Or those things that lead to eternal night? This brings us to our text for today. It's verse 26 of chapter 23. And as we look at this for a moment or two, three simple things we want to notice. Firstly, you have here God's relationship with his people. Notice what it says. My son... Give me thine heart. Now, the word heart here is all embracing. It's a word that means the will, the feelings, the intellect, the understanding, your wisdom. God says, give these characteristics of your life to the Lord. Give me your will, your feelings, your intellect, your understanding, your wisdom. Let your life revolve around me. Let me be your center. And you notice God doesn't say, my servant, give me thine heart, but my son. To be a servant of God is a great privilege. But servants in the real world can be dismissed. 
They can be laid off. They can be relieved of their duties and told that their services are no longer required. But here, God says, my son. Now, he's not addressing his own son, the Lord Jesus, who is his only dearly beloved. Rather, is he directing this plea to poor sinners whom he has been pleased to save by his wonderful grace. We have been made his sons by the spirit of adoption. And that suggests love. When a child is adopted, he's usually singled out from amongst a number of other children. Would be parents have come in and maybe they, they, they... they, they look at a number of children. There's one there that seems to stand out, whether it's his, his smile, the color of his eyes, or his hair, or some other feature. But there's something about that individual. And would-be parents decide, that's the one we want to adopt. When we consider what God sees in those whom he adopts, that's you and me, if you're saved, we, what he has chosen to adopt into his family. I often wonder, what was the Lord thinking? I look in the mirror and I think, what did the Lord ever see in this to choose me for adoption? We're all sinners by nature and by practice. And our sin in the eyes of one so holy is never, could never be an attractive thing. Rather, does he choose us not... He doesn't choose us for what we are. The Lord chooses us for what he can make out of us. And that that, that leaves us baffled. The transforming miracle of grace that the Almighty performs on the life of a sinner when he saves him is something totally amazing. Saved by grace alone. This is all my plea. Well, did the hymn writer pen those words? Amazing grace. Beloved, our Bible says now, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. First John 3 and 2. But listen, beloved, belonging to Christ is no light matter. This is an awesome privilege. Get a hold of it. Let the truth get a hold of your heart today. If you're saved, you have been singled out. You think of the multitude on the broad road today leading to hell's destruction. How many are already in a lost eternity and here you are, you're saved by grace. Why? Will the Lord ever see in you or me? I'm not saying this to be offensive. What do you ever see in us? You ever consider you could have been brought up as a Muslim, a Hindu, or Buddhist, or some of those false religions that have no salvation to offer their people. Question 34 of our shorter catechism asks the question, what is adoption? And the answer given is, adoption is an act of God's free grace, whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. What a statement that is. Where else would you find love like that? First John 3 and 1, and we sang a hymn based on this. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we shall be called the sons of God. How do we become the sons of God? We do so by faith in Christ. Oh, Modernist preachers uh, will tell us today that we're all God's family because he made us. That's a lovely sentiment, but it's not true. Oh, yes, we, we're certainly we're his creation. And it has to be said, fearfully and wonderfully made. The human body is a very complex piece of machinery. Uh, it needs to be looked after, if only... It, it, it could only come about by great wisdom and power. Evolutionists talk the biggest load of nonsense about how man came into being. But only a complete fool would, would pay any heed to the misconstrued theories that uh, such people 
seek to propagate. And that's another subject. But just as the theory of man's evolving is not only false and unfounded, and it has to be said, makes a lie of Bible truth, so too the idea that all men are God's family is seriously misleading and is a dangerous heresy for it. It leads multitudes of precious souls into a false sense of security. Would it not be fair to suggest that if we are all the children of God, then we must all expect a place in the Father's house when we leave this life? There are false teachers, I'm sure you know, who will bury the dead in sure and certain hope of a joyful, re or glorious resurrection and a joyful reunion in heavenly places. Listen, this book says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, and it must be understood, except a man be born again. If he's not saved, he has no hope within him of any eternal bliss. If you choose, beloved, to live unsaved, and die unsaved. I'm sorry. You, there's no place for you in heaven. And don't get any thrill out of saying that. Your destiny is the caverns of the damned for all eternity. Let that truth get home to your heart, beloved. You need to be saved. No Christ, no hope. But to know Christ, K-N-O-W, is to know hope. Doesn't it stand to reason that if, if every man were born in the family of God, as, as so many claim, there was no need for a saviour to come into this world, was there? Die on a cross? Take our place, bear the judgment of, and wrath of God in order to deliver us from hell? If we were all God's children, there would be no need for that. But it's because of sin and the awful consequences of it that God, out of his great love for us, gave us the gift of his own dear son to die as our substitute, becoming sin for us in order, to, to, in order that we might be, be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Christ died to make us his, and only those who accept his offer of mercy and pardon are adopted into his family. You're only a son of God, daughter of God, when you receive Christ as your own personal Savior. John 1 and 12. To as many as received him, to them gave he power, or the right, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. So, we're not born as God's children. We've got to be born again. That's, this is elementary, really, isn't it? Yet so many miss it. You can never be his any other way. That's why he says, give me thine heart. Don't give your heart to the world. Don't keep it for yourself. Give your heart to Christ. Notice, secondly, God's requirement from his people. My son, give me thine heart. To become a Christian, you must give your heart to Christ. But notice what the text says. My son, give me thine heart. God is not speaking here to somebody who's not saved. Whereas we've just seen, if a man's unsaved, he cannot be called the son of God. This is for that man who already belongs to the Lord. This is directed to those who are already saved. God is saying to his own blood-bought people, my son, give me thine heart. This is for the believer. What does it tell us? Doesn't it show, doesn't it suggest that some who belong to him are only living an empty profession. Someone claims to be saved, but his heart denies that claim. Beloved, the, the biggest curse on society today isn't drugs, nor alcohol. It's not 
even the despicable behavior that we see going on in the world. It's not some twisted political idea. It's not the immorality that's all around us. No. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The greatest curse in any society is that of half-hearted Christianity or Christians who want their own way. Christians who want as much of self as they can get. This land is poisoned with people who have a name to be sealed, but no real love in their hearts for the one they call Lord. If they did love him, they would spend more time in his presence. They would show more enthusiasm for his work of winning souls for his kingdom. There are plenty of religious people all over the place. But so few want to live as real Christians. Want to rub shoulders with the world. Want to keep in with everybody. Oh, you've got to be friendly to your neighbor, yes. But as we were seeing in the, in the Bible class, there, there, there's a point of separation. Separated from the world. Separated unto Christ. Too many are like Ananias and Sapphira that we read of in Acts chapter 5. Verse 1 of that chapter reads, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? And as we read on, we discover God struck that man dead and his wife shortly after. They were only half-hearted in their love for God. Oh, the, the man tried to be a Christian on the outside, but in his heart, he was selfish, just wanted to do his own thing, expect God to rubber stamp everything he decided. It's not the way the Lord works. Oh, he had the hands on the clock set to the right time. But the main spring was broken. The Lord Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. And you can't serve God while your heart is divided. Now, Ananias' sin wasn't in keeping some of the revenue for himself. I don't think the Lord expected him to give it all. His sin came in the fact that he said he was giving it all. But he kept some back. I'm not talking necessarily about money today, but I trust you do tithe your, your increase to the Lord, your income. It is the Lord's, but we're, we're talking here about the heart. How much, beloved, how much of your heart does the Lord really have? Have you God's word on the choices you make in life? Like, for example, relationships, places of employment, Things you plan to do. Have you got the Lord's mind on that thing? Where you should live? The Lord has a purpose for his people, but you need to be walking, you need to be in the right place with him. Get it from the Lord in black and white. Some years ago, after we retired out of Tully Vallon, and up to live in Balamoni, we'd, we'd had a house up there, up there to live, loved it, loved the north coast. We have a daughter who lives in Waringstown, another one in Lisburn. And they were always at us, would you not come and live a bit nearer to us? And we, we thought about it, and we prayed about it, and we said, yes, well, we would like to do that. We can understand, we're not getting any younger, and they thought, well, if yours are going to start um, becoming old crocs, we'd need to be there to sort of keep an eye on you. And uh, we put the house on the market. I think it sat for 12 months. Uh, and nobody, nobody showed any interest. In fact, the, the uh, estate agent came around one time after a number of months. He says, I can't understand why people aren't inquiring about this house. Because it was a bungalow detached. And he says, people are always looking for bungalows. Why are they not looking for years? Then one day, I got an email 
I hadn't been to the previous presbytery, but I got an email to say there's a, a Saturday morning of prayer in Bush Mills. I didn't know what it was about, but I decided I'd go along to the prayer meeting anyway. It was only 15 minutes up the road. And on that Saturday morning, um, ministers and elders met, and they were praying for the future of the work in Bush Mills. It was in danger of closing. They were down to single figures, I think. And uh, at the close of the meeting, the moderator prayed. Mr. Greer was moderator at the time. He said, Lord, if you want this door kept open, this is on a Saturday morning. If you want this door kept open, do something unusual tomorrow. The tomorrow came, and there was a man came to get saved. They'd been praying for him for 40 years. Couldn't wait to get saved. But on that Saturday morning, Mr. Greer called me aside after the meeting. He said, I'd like to speak to you. I said, what have I done? <laughs> Moderator wants to talk to me. He said, the Lord put it upon my heart. There's a man in the meeting for this place. He says, it's you. Would you consider stepping into the pulpit and helping out with the work? Took that to the Lord. And, uh, well, I'm sure most of you know, I spent the next five and a half years in Bushman's and Continue to pray for that work, beloved. The Lord's really blessing. The Reverend Raymond Morrow was there today, and God's building the work up. They're now around about 40 attending on a Sabbath morning, and uh, things, are, things are just going well, and we rejoice in what the Lord's doing. But we, as I say, we spent those five and a half years, and uh, you get into your 70s, not just as fit as we used to be. I knocked every door in Bush Mills many occasions. But the Lord was showing us it's time to hang up the boots and hand the work over. And uh, we decided, okay, well, if the Lord wants us to do that, where do we move? Where do we, where, where do we go to? Do we stay here? Do we move? Do we sell up? The Lord told us, move. Uh, I can't remember the exact reference, but the verse that the Lord gave us was, go to your firstborn, that's the one who lives in Warringstown, and to the youngest, the one in Lisburn. And so we decided, we knew the Lord wanted us to move, and he found us the house. We moved down to Donatlone. Where do we worship? Lurgan's only 10 minutes away. Dromore's only 10 minutes away. Banbridge is close, less than 15 minutes. And we went around some of the churches, we knew how to settle somewhere. Where would the Lord have us? I mean, each of those preachers, when we went, we enjoyed them. We were made welcome. Any one of them would have, could have been a home for us. And we said, well, I'd take it to the Lord. Lord, we need, we need definite leading here. Where would you have us to be? I remember distinctly the morning I prayed that, I opened the scriptures, and the reading was all about Thomas the Reverend Thomas Murray, and I knew the Lord wants us in Lurgan. So that's, that's why we're there. That's why I say to you, beloved, don't make a move unless you have the mind of the Lord. When it came to selling the house that time, we put it on the market and said, Lord, if it's really your will for us to move, get us a quick sale and get us the asking price. It was sold in two weeks, and we got the price we're asking. Nobody else came near us. Turns out it was another retired minister who bought it, Presbyterian man. But it's, the Lord can work everything out. You let him have his way. I hadn't planned to say that today, but it, 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 it fits with what we're thinking of. It, it, is there some matter, beloved? And maybe, maybe you're toying about with some idea and you're wondering where, where should I be going get it from the Lord get a word from him and, and you can go anywhere you get it in black and white you can go anywhere no point saying with your lips Lord I'm all yours if part of you isn't prepared to let go of you is there a matter where God has challenged your heart and you've said to yourself, oh, well, if, if certain conditions were right, I, I could do this, I could do that. 
the circumstances will never be, the conditions will never be exactly what you want. But it was what the Lord wants. That's all that matters. You know, some have said, Lord, you get me out of such and such a difficulty. I'll give my life in service. The Lord has kept his side of the bargain with people. No. When it came to the crunch, they haven't held their side of the bargain. You know what that is? Half-heartedness. No, it's worse than that. It's rebellion. And God can't bless that. Thomas Huxley said, it doesn't take much of a man to be a Christian. It takes all of him. And Thomas Huxley was an agnostic. David said, I will praise thee with my whole heart. And so he did. Hosea said of Israel, their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. Israel had promised God that if he would deliver them from particular trouble, they would serve him, worship him. But when God kept his side of the bargain, Israel didn't keep their side. They may have forgotten their promise, but God didn't forget his. They even sang the same words of David's psalm, but they were singing a lie. Would you sing the hymn, beloved? Have you sung it all to Jesus I surrender? Did you mean it? Mark 12, 30 and 31, the Lord says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy strength, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And beloved, when you're when you get your love for the Lord right, your love for your neighbor will fall into place. God says, give me thine heart. That means all of it. You to, if you try to divide the physical organ, that heart that pumps blood around your body, you try to divide that, you know what's going to happen. Do you share your heart with the world? Divide your affection between God and yourself or something else. You're not going to do well spiritually. And God can see that. And that's why he wants your heart only for himself. Because only he can satisfy the needs of your heart. Let's notice here in closing, God's request to his people. What, what a battle there is these days for the heart. My son, give me thine heart. Don't give it to the world. Give it to me. Don't be keeping back part for yourself. That will only leave you unsatisfied. Too many of God's people are living for material things these days, trying to, to satisfy their souls with things. It doesn't work. Let me have your heart, God says, and, and see what blessing I have in store for you. And you notice the endearment here. The Lord, the Lord doesn't come and say, Hey, you. Listen, my son. There's endearment. A story was told of a young fella who lived out in the country. There was a wooded area. And just beyond the woods, there was a young lady who lived. They met, fell in love. And there was quite a... Well, the young lad's mother didn't really approve of the relationship. There was, there was something of a, a, a struggle of affection. The young lad loved his mother, but he loved the young lady too. And things came to a head when the young lady said, listen, it's either me or your mother. She says, here's what I want you to do. Take a knife and cut your mother's heart out and bring it to me. Well, you can understand the dilemma he was in. But he told his mother what he was thinking. She says, listen, if she means that much to you, do it. And he did. He took the knife. He cut out his mother's heart. Running through the wooded area, he tripped and fell. The story is that 
When he fell to the ground and dropped the heart, he heard the heart cry out, My son, did you hurt yourself when you fell? It's only a story, but it shows what real love a mother had for her son. And while it's true that there's no love like the love of a mother for a child, isn't it true also the love of God is far greater than any mother's love? Didn't God demonstrate that love when he put his own son on the cross for you and me? What are the things of earth compared with things eternal? Imagine what heaven must be like for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2 and 9 says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Beloved, if we could only see into heaven today, we would happily say good night to the things of this world. Paul said in Ephesians 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Our beloved God has given us more than just earth to enjoy. He's preparing heaven for those that love him. Colossians 3, 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I like to see people do well in this life. If God prospers you, he makes you a millionaire, that's, that's the Lord's business. Enjoy it. But I put it to you. You leave it all behind. I've often said it, it. It doesn't matter what size of a house you're carried out of. All that matters is, where will you be? If you're his, will you go home to heaven ashamed, embarrassed because you did very little for the Lord? Because you shared your heart with other things that were of a trivial nature? My son, give me thine heart. Where is your real heart today, beloved? You can't, you can't practice divided loyalties. You'll be the loser. Far better to yield up your whole heart to him. Let God bless you and make you to be a blessing. I, I know none of us deserve this. If we had what we deserve, we'd all be in hell already. We're only here by the grace of God. And if God has opened his heart to you, to love you, to give you so great salvation, why would you not open your heart to him? Say, Lord, Help me to live for thy glory. Oh, I trust the Lord will encourage you, bless you, and make you to be a blessing wherever you go. My son, give me thine heart. And we take time to sing a couple of verses in closing, please. 254. It's based... The hymn is based on this verse, Give me thy heart, says the Father above, no gift so precious to him as our love. 254, we'll stand together as we sing, please. <clears throat> Let's all stand.
And Father, I have to acknowledge today that so often, too often, our hearts are caught up in the things of this scene of time. All too often, we fail to give thee the heart's devotion that is our due. O oh Lord, we pray, deliver us from selfishness. Deliver us, Lord, from holding back on thee. Thou hast promised us blessing in an abundance, cup full, running over. We ask thee, Lord, teach us the art of full surrender. Help us to live for thy glory. When we get out of bed in the morning, may we determine I'll live this day for the glory of God. Help us so to do. Bless thy people. Encourage every child of God. Lead us on with thyself, Lord. Pour out thy spirit powerfully upon us. Bless again those who need that special touch. I and any who are not saved. Lord, show them what they're missing. Give them the grace to finish with sin. Come and close in with thine offer of mercy. Bless them and make them to be a blessing. Part us now in thy fear and with thy favor. Remember thy servant as he comes back to minister tonight. Take him up and use him mightily for thy glory and the extension of thy kingdom. Grant that thy name will be magnified in this place this day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.